Hmm, what's this? Hello, welcome back to The Freak Show. Bumpy McSquiggums here. I want to thank you all for joining me as I start up a very special Let's Play and coverage of one of my favorite games of all time. And it's a game that's really close to my heart, and I'll explain all this really briefly, guys. I'm going to try to get it all in within a minute, and then we'll actually hop in and get some gameplay going. So, Age of Wonders 3, it's by Triumph Studios. Back before I had even 100 subscribers, I had contacted these guys, and I just kind of out of the blue was like, well, I really like the Age of Wonders stuff. I'd love to do coverage of this game, and they're like, hey, you know what, here, check it out, man. We believe in you. Go. And I did coverage of it. It didn't do super well. Obviously, I didn't have that many subscribers or a following, but I'm back. I have more. I have all of you people here at The Freak Show. We're going to go and make another run at this. I am now semi-famous for my HOM series and games of that nature. This game is similar to that in many ways. It's got other stuff like civilization type feel and everything. It's a really, really good game, guys. I'm excited to revisit this and play through. So I'm going to start playing through right now with the Elven Court. We'll go into the Commonwealth and eventually Golden Realms. There's also some community uh, scenarios and campaigns and all sorts of other various stuff, as this is Steam Workshop compatible. So I'm looking forward to checking some of those out. I haven't downloaded any of them off of the Workshop yet, but I did see somebody was remaking Age of Wonders, the original game, one. I believe on this engine and this graphics and everything else, so I'm pretty eager and excited to see how that plays out too. So, let's hop in and start. I'm going to play through all of the campaigns, that's going to be the plan, and I'll buy the final expansion once we're done with this. I'm excited guys, so let's begin. The Wheel of Ages turns, set in motion by two opposing powers preparing for war. The Commonwealth, humanity's greatest empire, spreads to every continent. Emperor Leonis promises to reward ambition regardless of race, creed, or descent. The Empire's machines roll forward, bringing wealth to those willing to crush all opposition. The Elven Court will not submit. It is our duty to protect Athla, so that the wonders of our world will never fade. My name is Sundran, and this is my journal. My father is King Saradas, once first Stormlord of the Dark Elves. My mother is Julia, former Queen of the Wood Elves. Their passion reunited dark and light souls, restoring the High Elves. Their power reinvigorated the glory of Ineoch's ancient elven court. My brother, Prince Thanis, is first born. He is schooled in war and statecraft, destined to great deeds. I was born second, and a girl. All my father wants me to do is secure a powerful husband, but I want none of that. In public, I may be a dutiful daughter, but I have trained and I have spied. I will be more than just a princess. In the court, envoys come and go. Everyone talks of war. Many flock to the banner of our elven court, seeking refuge from the human-run commonwealth with their technologies of metal and smoke. All right, looks like I get to talk. <laughs> All right, Warlock, one of the advisors of your father, approaches you with an offer. I have noticed that your interest in the matters of state, Sundrin, it is wise of you to train for possible conflict. The humans are growing ever bolder, and if war should come, the Elven Court will be stronger for your efforts. If you want to learn more, I can tutor you. Yes, we're actually going to play through the tutorial, guys. If you've been around the channel for any length of time, you guys know that I like to actually play through tutorials. That way, if you guys want to skip it when you get your hands on the game and you want to play the game, you can because I've already done it for you. And it'll give you a better understanding, or if I already know a game pretty well, if I don't play the th through the tutorial, I might do stuff that I don't know that you guys don't know how to do, and I might miss teaching you guys how to play properly. So, that being said, we're going to play through it. Oh, I'm super excited. Ah, It's been a while since I got to play this, guys. I can't wait. I've actually been playing some random maps with Mutanot. He finally started playing the game after I begged him. Alright, so Sundran House of Ineok, it is our turn. High Elf, Rogue, your rise to power begins. Welcome to Aldor. This legendary isle is pivotal in the history of the Elves. But pox-ridden vermin known as goblins are freely defiling his beauty with their blighted diseases, even ransacking the tomb of your grandmother, Elwyn. 
You shall have to cleanse this land of their insolent presence. I have given you the Tome of Wonders, a book describing your world, or sorry, our world in detail. Sometimes I will refer to it. You can click on my blue words to get extra information from the tome. Let's start with building a, sto a storehouse in your village. It will help the village to grow into a town faster, expanding your domain and giving you more income and production capacity, which you will need for training new armies. Left click on your city and open the city interface. Alright, so now we can get back up to the game here. So this is a turn-based strategy game. It's going to look very, very, very similar to Civilization or any of the games in that genre. You'll see it's going to be very similar to that. It's also going to look similar to Hom in many respects, but the way the combat works is what I really, really, really like. I think it shines beautifully and really well in this game, and I'm a big fan. So, let's begin. Alright, into the city. Alright, so the city overview. Welcome to your city. Selecting a city opens the city overview. Makes sense, right? The city overview gives you information on the city's current population, size, and income. Resources produced in cities are added to your global resource pool. Gold is used to build city upgrades and units. Mana is used to cast spells, and knowledge is used to research new skills. Production indicates how fast the city can build city upgrades and units. Population growth determines the time it takes for the city to grow. What does all that mean? Well, they may explain it, and if they don't, I will. The tabs to the left of the screen show the units and the upgrades a city can produce, while the queue of things the city is producing is displayed in the center of the screen. That's right up here, guys. Uh, the total cost of a unit, upgraded, or unit or upgrade is divided by the production of a city determines the number of turns it takes for it to be built. All right, since you already start with a large army, you should concentrate on upgrading your city. Cool. All right, more on city production. Building a storehouse in the city will increase the city's population growth by 100, allowing the city to grow and expand its borders faster. To build a storehouse, select Produce Upgrade from the tabs on the left. Select the storehouse by clicking on it and then clicking on the Produce button, which is down there. I think you could also double-click it. All right, so we're going to go over here. We're going to go to Produce Upgrades, and we're going to go down to Storehouse, and then it says we can go down here to Produce, or we can do, like I said, and double-click it. Bam! There it is. Double clicked. Alright, so we have done that. And now we can click off of the city. Unless I... It didn't work because I didn't click produce. Nope, oh, that worked. Okay. So the gold is here. Our income is a base of 10 from the city. We get 10 mana from the city. We get 3 knowledge, 45 production, and we're gaining 250 population. But we're also losing 10% of that because we're high elves, so we're only getting 225. Now if you take a look right under here, keep an eye on my mouse, guys. It's going to be uh, difficult to see sometimes. But if you hover over right here, it will show the village population and growth. Our current population is at 3,500. We need to be at 6,000 to grow to the next thing. And when you grow the entire area around this little ring here, it'll expand out by one. So we'll actually control more area with our city. And if there's anything within the city, like this happens to be a mana node, if there was something one further out, we would accomplish that in, what is it, 12 turns. So it shows our current population is 3,500, our population growth is 225, and we need to get it up to 6,000, which will take 12 turns at our current population growth. So that's how all that works, guys and gals. And you'll see at the top of the screen our gold, our crystal, and our knowledge income, as well as how many casting points we have for each day the casting points will reset we only have 20 to start with and we're getting 61 gold per turn so the base is 75 we get 10 for the city and with all of our units it's a minus 24 and that's where you get that from so very basic stuff guys and gals as you can see it all makes sense right alright so we've done that I'm gonna click on our army here you have selected an army an army is a stack of up to of one up to six units on a single hex. It is used to explore the world, attack your enemies, and defend your cities. When an army is selected, you can click on each unit's icon to get more information about them. After selecting an army, you can order it to move by right-clicking the hexagon you want it to move to. A preview will highlight the route to be taken, with the section in green showing how far your army is able to move this turn. 
Move Sun Sundren's army to the gold mine to the northeast by right clicking on it. Alright, the gold mine. This is the gold mine right here. It's actually being controlled by this little army of independents. They're neutral toward us, but they're not part of any one particular group. So attacking them is... It, it doesn't have any political or uh, diplomatic problems. So we can definitely attack them without any retribution from anything around us or it being bad. So essentially, think of this as like a neutral army you're able to attack, right? Uh, it's being controlled or, or protected by a Goblin Blight Doctor, which is a Tier 2 unit. You can actually see all the stuff there. If you want to see more about the unit, you can left-click on it, and it will show you more details about the unit, which is pretty cool. And it always has a little description down here, which is pretty cool. Sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's not. Anyway, they're there. You can rotate around to see what they look like a little bit better. Pretty cool stuff, i got to say. And then over here we have a Goblin Marauder and a Goblin Untouchable. So two Tier 1 units and a Tier 3 unit. Let's take a look at our army real quick. So we have Sundrin, uh, the House of Ineox uh, leader. She's a High Elf Rogue. She's level 1. We have a High Elf Storm Sister. She's a Tier 2 unit. We have another one of those. And then we have two Tier 1 Swordsmen. Alright, I'm going to zoom out a little bit here. Oh, this is another thing that's cool, guys. So you have your mini-map down here, but you can actually zoom way out with the map, and i got to tell you, I love this. This, to me, is like the greatest thing ever. I absolutely love the fact that you can zoom this far out on the map and have a really, really good representation of what's going on. And you can zoom in a little bit closer, and then when you get to a certain point, which is probably the next spot here, oh, oh even closer than I thought, boom, you go right back into the map. It's really well done, guys. This game is beautiful. It's Like I said, it's one of my favorites. I really like it, and I'm glad I'm going to give it a shot again and showcase it for all of you. So hopefully I can make a few new fans. All right, so we're going to move here. High Elf Swordsman. Sundren, it is good to see you. We were on our way to welcome you to the city, only to see that these goblins have taken over the gold mine. Their army is too strong for us. If we attack with both our armies, we can overwhelm them with superior numbers. All right, Warlock says, One moment, Sundren. More armies are always good, but armies need to be paid upkeep now these soldiers have joined us our gold income will be lower all right that's fair all right so you see over here on the left we actually have these two dudes that are going to join now the way combat and battling people works in this game is you can flank around so every single hex that surrounds this guy is a potential spot where you can put an army to attack him from now, how does this look when you actually attack I'm gonna right click again and here it is. So you see this hex right here, and this one is where we're actually at on the map in comparison to him. He's in the middle. So we'll actually be able to reinforce him here and here. The same thing goes when you're being attacked. If you have adjacent units and they attack in, like if he attacked us, we would have we would be in the middle, he would be here, and we would have allies up here. So this is really cool. I really like this stuff. We're going to obviously manual combat most of these. Alright, so let's do battle. Alright, skip intro. Oh, and that's right. Single player, the combat speed is different. We can actually change it to whatever we want. I'll probably move it up to 2x. I think that's going to be fine. 4x is a little bit too quick. Alright, attacking other armies. It is time for us to begin our attack on the enemy. The defenders always get to act first. We should use this moment to examine our opponents and think up a strategy. Alright, it's now our turn. Now it is time for us to act. We can select individual units and give them orders. Once all of our units have moved, we can end our turn. Every unit has three action points, which are used up by moving and attacking. Alright, so I love the way combat works in this game, guys. I told you this before. I think it's beautiful. I'm sorry, guys. I'm getting re-familiar with the, uh, the camera and how it all works out. So you can move around with WASD. I believe you can also click and drag, though it's a little bit slower than you would like. You can uh, pan, oh, do you know you can do that? You can pan differently with the uh, middle mouse button. I may have screwed that up. I actually like the default settings, so I may have made it worse, and I apologize for that. You can rotate with Q and E. WASD moves the camera around. That's pretty much all you need to know. All right, so each unit, unlike in the HOM series, is all going to be a singular unit. There are no stacks of 1,000 units or 50 guys. Each unit is one. Each army can hold up to only six. So just be aware of all this stuff, guys and gals. Alright, swordsmen are infantry units. Swordsmen have swords and shields and are ideal for protecting your longbowmen and storm sisters. So essentially infantry to protect your guys. Alright, so what's very important to know about these three different colors, green basically means you can move within that area and still have all three of your action points. 
And why would this be important? Say you had a long bowman or something that could attack three times from range. If you were able to get close enough to this guy to get rid of all your range penalty and still be within the green area, you could actually attack three times. If you move into the yellow area, you can only attack twice. And if you move into the orange area, you can only attack once. And that's how it all works. Same thing with melee. If, say, one of these guys were chilling, like, right here, we would attack. We would actually attack them three times. However, they would also counterattack us three times. And if they do counterattack three times, that means that they have to skip their next turn. So there's a lot of checks and balances in this game, and i got to say I'm a massive fan. I, I, I can't tell you how much I like the combat in this game. All right, so here's our normal army. This is the one with the hero. There's Sundran. Uh, Sundran is your leader. Leaders are one of the strongest units in your army. They are capable of casting spells in battle instead of attacking. They can even cast spells while they're not personally present on the battlefield, though it's a lot more expensive to do so. During your journey, you will also encounter heroes who have their own spells and special abilities to use in battle. Alright, taking a look at her, she's got Shoot Darts and Shoot Acid Darts as her ranged attacks. The, she's one of those people that if we had somebody within range and she was in the green, she could shoot three times. There are other attacks where maybe you have a musket or a crossbow, you only fire once. In that case, you just get as close to the enemy as you can to make sure you get rid of that ranged penalty and you unload on them. Alright, let's talk to the Storm Sisters now. Storm Sisters are support units. They have a powerful ranged attack that does shock damage, making them very effective against machines. They also have the stunning touch ability, letting them paralyze dangerous enemy units before they can do too much damage. Cool. Alright, we already know about the swordsmen, and that's it. So, here we are with the other two that joined the battle from the side, and we need to start moving up and figuring out exactly how we want to attack. So I'm going to move up this way. Now it's always important as well, guys and gals, I should make mention of this, to actually click on your enemy to see what the enemy movement range is, and beyond that to see what the enemy does. This is a goblin marauder. All he can do is move, melee strike, and defend. This guy is a goblin blight doctor. He can move, he can shoot poison bolts, he can defend, he can do weakening, which is apparently, I'm going to guess, a touch skill? Well, it says medium range, so that's not even within melee. He's also got a melee strike, and he's got cure disease. If any of his units get diseased, he can actually cure it. And then these guys are also ranged. The untouchables, they have a poison spit attack. Now, it doesn't say it can attack up to three times like this skill does. It can trigger up to three times. This one just says it does 11 damage. So basically, he can run straight at somebody, get as close as he can, and spit once, and it will do maximum damage if he's outside or within the ranged penalty thing. So he can shoot this far, but I think he has to be like here or here to actually get the full effect of his damage. So it's all very interesting. You'll see how it plays out as we go through, guys. I'm going to break this open because it's in my way. Now, if you guys are playing and you want your units to actually move a little bit quicker, like you issue an order and you're just taking too long and you're like, Bruh! see how slowly they move? If you right click a second time, they'll actually run to the spot. So that's an easy way of speeding up the game a little bit for yourselves. So the High Elf Swordsmen are going over there. I'm going to try to get this High Elf Swordsman to come over this way and the Storm Sisters to maybe go out wide over here. Now, it's possible that we'll lose somebody because I'm probably going to be terrible at doing something, but not necessarily. We can cast a spell. I'm going to see what spells she has available. On this page of our spell book, we can see our combat spells. When your leader casts spells in tactical combat, she uses some casting points. So 20 out of 20 right there. And she would also use those for global spells on the strategic map. So casting spells in battle may delay your spells you cast outside of battle. When you cast a spell with your leader in combat, she will use up all her action points and will not and will not enter guard mode, leaving her defenseless. So essentially, you want to make sure you move her either into a defensive position or if you're trying to close the distance with enemies and you're not going to put yourself into danger, move forward before casting a spell. Unfortunately, right now, it does not look like any of these spells are able to do anything. She did not act this turn. They have lied. I'm fairly certain that's how it works, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you can't move first. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I could be lying to you guys right now. I was pretty sure that was the case. I'm pretty sure that's how it's been working in our multiplayer game, but we'll see. All right, we're ending our turn. You just ended your turn. Any units who still have action points left will automatically use the guard ability. 
Guarding gives a bonus to defense and resistance and extends a unit's threatened zone to hexes behind it so it cannot be flanked. Units also replenish their action points at the end of every turn. Alright. They did not move. Okay, so... I would like to... See if I can't get into a decent range here. You are actually outside my range. So we're going to try using the spell this time. A rain of Poison Blades. This is going to do a pretty decent chunk of damage, but it's also going to cost us 10 of our crystals and 10 of our casting points. I think it's going to be 10 casting points. Yeah, it's 10 casting points. Alright, so we're going to go over here. We're going to left click on these guys. They have 80% blight prote protection. These guys have 40. These guys have 100. So the best we could do, the most damage we could do, 8 to 12 and then 4 to 6. So we would do 12 to... 12 to 18 is the most damage we could do on them. Here it's going to be 12 to 16 is the most damage we could do on them. They have 30 HP, these guys have 40, those guys have 31. So we're going to go on these guys. We did 8 to 5, definitely not the high end of the damage threshold, but it's still a decent amount. Alright, we'll move the Storm Sisters up after we move our Swordsmen up a bit more. We're going to attack this thing, kind of get it out of our way. We're going to move here. Maybe even there. Move our swordsman up a little bit further. This guy should be able to close, and the enemy will attack us this next turn. So be aware of that. We can try to make multiple targets so he kind of splits his forces. That's going to be the plan. All right, so we're done. I'm going to end my turn here. And we're going to 2x the enemy's turns here. Weakened our hero. The attack is going to come out onto our hero. 22 damage. Pretty impressive. Now, retaliation. So a unit just got hit in melee. That unit just retaliated because it was struck in melee combat. Retaliating uses up that unit's action points. So if it retaliates three times, it has no more action points left to act in its own turn. So it only got hit once. It retaliated once. That's all fine and good. All right, so the Storm Sisters are here. We're going to go with Shock Bolts, and we are going to... You have to right-click when you use attack skills. So one, two, three... There it is. I right-clicked again to get them to go a little bit quicker there. We're going to move our swordsman. I'm going to actually try and flank this guy. I'm going to move right up behind him and attack. This unit has been flanked, meaning it has been attacked from the hex outside of its threatened zone. When a unit is flanked, it takes more damage and loses the ability to retaliate as it turns to face its attacker. Flanking is a vital part of combat. It allows you to maximize the damage you do while taking the minimal amount of damage yourself. Alright, so there you go, folks. We did a lot of damage there, and now this guy is going to be flanked once again. And we should be able to pretty much own him. I'm going to move here and then attack again. Just to guarantee we got the full flanking, and we did. Alright, I'm going to move the Storm Sisters up to here. We're going to take a look. There's a range penalty of 50%. So we do 3 to 5 times 3, so that's, what, uh, 9 to 15? Now if we move up one more hex, we'll be outside the range penalty. And now we'll do 6 to 10. So we're only going to be able to attack twice, but we're going to be able to do 12 to 20 damage. So it's definitely worth the effort to move up that one spot to get the better attack. So we're going to launch it. There it is, and there it is. A bit more damage. Unfortunately, our High Elf Swordsman cannot quite close with them. And unfortunately, our... our other people are a little bit too far away as well. Line of Sight penalty and other penalties. So we're going to move all the way there and we get one shot, 8 to 12. So we're going to do a decent amount of damage there. We got a flanking bonus and what we're going to do, we could use those darts that I was talking about earlier. In fact, we may still do that. But I think I'd rather just charge them down with our hero and kill it. There's no way we can lose. We have flanking, we have charge, and we have backstab. We're going to do 22 to 34 damage and he's only got 8 health. So this is a guaranteed kill. So we'll charge in, and even with a fumbled attack, because of low morale and the weakness and everything else, we still managed to do it. How does it feel, Sundrin? Victory on the field of battle. I can see you have it in you to become a capable leader. Those goblins are nothing but filthy, poisonous creatures, relying on weakening their enemies and spreading their blighted diseases. We had best rid ourselves of them entirely. Alright, we attacked, we won, we lost a little bit of HP, 22 on her, maybe a little bit more, a little tiny bit on the swordsman. 
but overall it wasn't too big of a loss. All right, we had no turn limit. All we had to do was clear out the gold mine. And some wretched goblins have taken over a gold mine. We have to take it back. Attacking with multiple armies allows you to take more units into battle, leading to easier victories with less casualties. All right, exploring the gold mine, you discover 51 gold. Anytime you take over one of these things that neutral people are sitting on top of, you generally get some sort of benefit, some sort of gold, mana, research, or something. You get something out of it. Sometimes you get rewarded extra units. Other times you get items. I mean, there's a lot of different rewards you can actually gain. So, we got that taken care of and that handled, which was a lot of fun. I enjoyed the combat. Even the simple, easy gimme battles are still fun for me. Alright, we're going to click over here to do research. This is your skill book. The current page shows the skills that you can research, which include new spells, upgrades to your empire, and new units you can produce. Knowledge is used to fuel the research. It is produced in your cities from laboratories and observatories, as well as from certain structures in your domain, such as the Vault of Knowledge. Start researching basic seafaring since you are on an island. Alright, so we have to start with that. Well, there we go, we will start doing that, and then here's our actual mission objective. We're going to left click on it and it'll say, Explore the island. Aldor, this island belongs to the Elven Court. Goblins are desecrating its pristine nature and despoiling the tomb of Elwyn, once queen of all elves. We should explore the island and see what happened to Elwyn's tomb for ourselves. To do this, we can capture watchtowers or send units to scout. Okay, and an army requires our orders, and we can still do a little bit more movement. We can do a bunch of various different things, guys and gals. I may tweak some of the sound settings and stuff. I feel like the music's slightly too loud overall, so I may lower it like maybe 5% or something, see if that's a little bit of a better mix. But I think this is the perfect place to break off episode 1. We got through our first battle, I explained the crap out of the game. It's going to be a lot of fun, guys and gals. I, like I said, I've been looking forward to this for a long time, and I hope you guys really enjoy this. It's a game that may not have blipped on your radar, and if you hadn't blipped it on your radar, or you didn't know about it, or you, you know, you've never heard of it, it's a really good game. You should 100% get behind it, grab it, and play the living poo out of it, because it's fantastic. All right, folks, if you enjoyed, feel free to like, comment, subscribe, and share it. And I will be back, I don't know, probably day after tomorrow with another installment of Age of Wonders 3. Until then, my name is Bumpy McSquiggums. Thank you for stopping by the Freak Show, and I will see you later.